Richard Cambridge has been um, been carrying on a tradition we started back in 1995 of a poet's theater that really takes a deep dive into various aspects of the literary arts. And tonight is no exception. It's a real honor to be presenting about place, the geographies of justice, a preview of the next issue being produced by the journal for um, the Black Earth Institute. With that said, Richard, why don't hey you take the stage and let us know what's going on. Hi there, you all. Uh, we've been having a lot of fun back in the green room. Uh, I'm one of the original fellows of the Black Earth Institute, which is a progressive think tank that focuses on the intersection of social justice, the environment, and spirituality. And every three years, we choose a cohort of fellows. And one of the uh, responsibilities of the fellows is to edit one of the issues of About Place, which is the sort of the, the banner, I guess, as Allen Ginsberg would say, that goes forth and announces us into the world. And this issue is, uh, I was very honored to work with Alexis Latham, who is the editor, uh, co-editing also with Charles Coe. Uh, Alexis chose the topic, the geographies of justice. You've probably read it in it in the, in the 0830 Club, but I'll just read it here. The geographies of justice reimagines the maps that divide us into the privileged and the disadvantaged, that value some lives more than others, works that expose systems of medical, environmental, and economic apartheid, work that opens itself to the larger world that takes a long view that peels back the maps imposed through the historical and ecological violence and shows awareness of who and what was here before. Work that is located in the sacred geographies that has come from the dif difficult ascent, work that is visionary. Poems, essays, stories, and artwork born from the ascents and descents, passages through the hollows of grief and moments of transcendent vision. Uh, this was quite a bear to wrestle out into uh, a creative issue. And I'm real honored to be part of Alexis's team and part of what we've chosen. Uh, the readers tonight are all part of this issue. And uh, so you're gonna be hearing from all of them. Uh, the first is going to be Jacqueline Johnson. Uh, she's a fellow, a current fellow of the Black Earth Institute. And I'll just read a bit about her. She is a multidisciplinary artist who works in poetry and fiction as well as fiber arts. Jacqueline, I'd like you to say a little bit about your fiber arts. Uh, she's author of A Woman's Season, Main Street Rag, A Gathering of Mother Tongues, winner of the third annual White Pine Press Poetry Prize and a Kaveh Kanem Fellow. Jacqueline, it's been awful fun meeting you and I know you're a real rabble rouser, so. Why don't you just like uh, shake it out there for all of us? All the editors on the forthcoming issue. We only have a few days more to wait. Um, it's really a joy to be a, um, a part of this forum. I just want to say that um, uh, I want to dedicate my reading to those we have lost uh, during this past season and those who have survived. Um, it is so important that there be both sides of, 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 of this effort. Um, and I also want to um, remember the name of Micaiah Bryant, who we lost a few days ago uh, to uh, police violence. Um, I'll say a few, one thing and in, in, in regarding my fiber art and that and that is um, I'm a non-traditional quilter. I love the tradition, but I it's the jumping off point for me. So um, I often take on subjects that are in the political world or the natural world. So that's all I'll say. I'm gonna read about 
four or five poems and exit stage left uh, and let the others do their thing. So it's my privilege and, and, and joy to be here. My first poem is This America. Soft leaves of a real spring bursting free on every branch. So glad to be a part of creation. Seven artists sitting in a half shell, each a lit flame. We don't have all the answers our people crave, but together we can create something we can survive with. Savor the sister in white, smudging sage over policemen in riot gear. What mojo do we need for this time, where protesters are framed as terrorists, and this week we are asked to believe a lone Black man broke his own spine in three places? How do we arm and protect ourselves in this America? Two. The next poem I'm going to read um, references something called the Malaika, and the Malaika are angels in the Swahili language, and this is called the Malaika Dance in My Shoes. Language came to the door, wearing fuchsia shoes and three sandy red braids. Language sashayed to the door and opened another door and another door and another door as endless kink in my hair unraveled. Language banged on the door, baring her buck teeth, cursing the hell out of me, shoeless, wearing a chartreuse lace boo-boo, spraying me with wisdom's juju jive. And I was alone but not lonely turning the great nothing they gave me into a world, a real world, discovering the simplest loves can be a whole life, transcended change makers, code switchers, make fools out of themselves, hungry for love's discernment. Who gave away all the wine? Is that local water on the table? I try not to eat the bitter seeds from the bitter past. Language jumped inside my shoes like the Malika, whispering, find anything new, even something half used to begin again, to begin again. Lord, what does it mean to begin again? As I wander into a new self, become a different woman. Do not erase me with anger. Do not erase me with blindness. Do not erase me with judgment, hive of a thousand bee wings buzzing, a lifetime of regrets. Do not erase me with those who know nothing of love, of equanimity, or grace. Do not erase me with the acts of the coward. Do not erase me with those who fear their mother's truth. Do not erase my light. Do not erase me. Do not erase me. The next poem I'm going to read is in the forthcoming issue, Geographies of Justice. This is called Ode to Ian Sa. And I'm not going to bother to say who she is. You will find that out in the poem. Iyansa, austere gates of divine mystery, which you so aptly guard, are now flung open, accepting so many from the hospitals, nursing homes, streets, and transit. The lines between the city of the living and the city of the dead, now blurred, open for quick crossings within, without the rituals or ceremonies of leave-taking and long goodbyes. Once you were content to be keeper of secrets, wearing a rose-colored head wrap, quietly attending to the new returnees, your legion of invisible ones always willing to aid the living. Now the city where I live has so many dead. You have taken up residence in parking lots with truckloads of former husbands, wives, grandmothers, fathers, sons, and daughters. In this America, your power is unquantifiable as we count lives lost and transfigured forever. You are now stronger than you ever intended to be. Your tears flow unceasing. Fight to keep as many as you can alive. Iyansa, goddess whose gifts can both save us and give others a quick merciful end. We dream of a different time, yet unborn. Purple-hued tempests fly all around the earth, where only a hint of your power is mirrored. Iyansa, fierce owner of the ancestral realm, bless the day you can close your gates. And I have um, 
think it's like two other poems. Soul Memory. And this poem is really um, one that I think um, uh, is in, uh, that I would uh, uh, specifically like to uh, dedicate to Micaiah Bryant. Soul Memory. And it was originally written for another unfortunate Black woman named Renisha McBride. Forgive the grandmother who found you barely conscious, mumbling, stupid drunk, walking circles around your car, who thought she could leave you and go back into her house. Forgive the loss of mother wit, the inability to grab you and bring you daughter, you baby girl, on into the house. Forgive her lost in the disconnect of centuries to not call for an ambulance to get you help. Forgive her return to the street to find you gone out of sight. Too old to follow you, to get someone, anyone to go look for you. Forgive yourself for going out that night of all nights to party and drink, to hang out like any normal 19 year old, to know highness, to believe you were in control. Forgive the lost ones of you. Forgive the night so dark your brown skin self could not be found. Forgive your Ori so blindly drunk and in shock from a car crash. Forgive the incoherent selves wandering only knowing to seek help, crying for help. Forgive this moment, day, that you went out into that old white woods and neighborhood. Forgive yourself so lost, mother wit and father wit gone, so lost, so shocked, so drunk you ring that man's door, and all your last moments lost in the horror of shots to your head, heart, and soul. Forgive the night you wanted to party so, wanted to live so. Forgive all the wrong turns, the last four drinks you had. Forgive yourself for thinking somehow you were in control, had done this how many times before? Forgive the cursed moment of speed of all the wrong turns of walking and walking on the longest walk that would never end until you were nothing but soul. Lost black woman, lost black girl on a white man's porch in a place so bad he never gave you a chance. Came out shooting at your blackness, black woman, blackness seeking help. Forgive this time, this moment that never gave you a chance. Forgive all the wrong turns, the speed, the drinks, the desire to party. Forgive this time that never gave you a chance. And I'm gonna close with uh, uh, this poem. It's called On the D Train. He used to be a poet in, Nick, in New York City called Rich Barty. And he read poems on the New York City subway and usually the D train. And he had, he had like funny lines like uh, uh, less mugging, more hugging, things like that. Um, yeah. On the D, <laughs> on the D train. Starshango on the D train with his big bag of tricks and familiar song, cutting jokes and truth in the same breath. So Shango, humble in blue collar shoes, shape shifting, turning words into stars. So Shango on the D train, wearing an Applejack, rhapsodizing, hollering, and singing the blues. So Shango. Collecting converts and heads for his poetential limitless drumbeat beating. Saw Shango on the D train doing a peace dance, talking smooth about love, about us loving us for a change. Yeah. That's the baton. <laughs> thank you. Oh, that was terrific. That was terrific. Jacqueline, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Uh, next. Woo! <laughs> Woo! You kicked us off right. <laughs> All right. Next is Gabriela Hollis, uh, immigrated to Canada during the early 1980s, grew up in northern Alberta and lived in Alaska for seven years. Uh, I can't imagine what that is like being from New England, but uh, golly, that's amazing. Uh, your poetry's appeared in Prairie Fire, December Magazine, Rock and Sling, the Louisiana Review. And uh, very much so. Uh, 
in one particular poem upon being told, uh, and we talked with this in an email that you, you had um, started, I believe that the poem is a series of questions, but you begin it with markings. Uh, I don't know what they are. You could say they're petroglyphs, they're markings that you use a keyboard with, but uh, it made the poem elegant in a way that I can't understand, uh, maybe intuitively. Uh, whatever you can say about that is fine. It doesn't have to be rhyme or reason, but uh, I'd just like to hear part of your uh, process. Okay, yeah, thank you, Richard and Alexis and everyone from the journal and everyone at 830 Club. Um, yeah, it's just a real honor to be here. It's really exciting and Jacqueline's reading was uh, amazing. Uh, in regards to the markings in the beginning of my poem, um, yeah, to be honest, I just, I really wanted each question to kind of have a pause and, and a moment of reflection and um, because there kind of are a lot and it's a, it's a fairly lengthy poem, it fills the whole page. Um, I just started kind of playing around with the imagery of these markings and uh, just kind of settled on these. So that's kind of all I can really say. They just seem to fit. Um, there's two main parts and they're separated also by sort of a central marking. Uh, and some, you know, it can be read uh, or heard as a little bit of sort of like a play on the past and the present or sort of a reflection on time. So um, yeah, my, the markings just kind of um, are really a, a moment of pause as well. So. And I just have it on the screen here. So uh, we'll be kind of going back and forth. Uh, upon being told these were former lands. Did you have a name for the fan of the cottonwoods reach? Did the fog smell sweet like dripping fruit? Did the call of the wolf quiet the children or did they echo its good company? And the prairie dogs, did they sing? Did the flat gray sky draw you back inside to the heat in the muscle of his shoulder? Did you wake in the morning with ritual? Did the smooth mounds of the hills, red tips in relief, remind you of her nipples erect and alive in your mouth? Did the sun in the morning along the horizon recall the spray of intent in the burst of a flower? Do you remember the paint of stretch marks along the belly of your mother? Did you have a name for this color? Did you have a name for the light that slipped behind the eye of the moon? Did the sage grush grow as plentiful? Did you find its old fingers in the folds of your child's skirt buried deep like a secret? Did the bear in the hills call itself one name then retreat to the mountains by another? Did each creek have a name? Did you find the folds of the grasses something to admire that caught your attention when the mind was uncluttered? Did you find your mind cluttered? Did you have a name for each gesture of sky? Did the names you were given honor you? Did the dreaming prepare you? Did you try to warn us? Was the land as treeless, as wind formed, as warm? Was there a name for the crows as they thundered past? To lovers, the ravens, did you know we would poison the animals later? Was there a constant drone of traffic, ground ridden, sky blasted? And what of the invisible cunning waves through the body? Was there cancer, disease, or did everyone grow old, even those left behind in the dark of the freeze? Were there ticks, chronic wasting disease? Were there secrets? Was the sound of your bow faster than wind? Was the wild white flag and the flea of the deer as common as erupted? Was your lovemaking freer under watch of the bear? Were you safe in the place of sandstone and tower before a red road slashed the hidden into view? 
Was there a name for the object placed in your hands? As cool and thin and white as spring ice suspended in the turn of the land? Was there a name for the branches strung with tight tension for the land drawn and quartered? Was the arrival seen in your dreams? Was the land in which you were cornered familiar to you? Was there a guide in the metaphor if you lost sight of the way? Was the evening closed with ritual? Was the naming they gave you what you were meant to be called? Was murder worse or the word former? Were we warned? And yeah, I have a couple more to read. Uh, they're not quite as long. Uh, and I do wanna say that um, I'm here um, on traditional Kitanaha land in southeastern British Columbia in Canada. Um, and uh, yeah, I think the next one I will read is quite a bit different. Just gonna shrink that. Um, and then I think I have one or two more short ones. Uh, so this next poem is called uh, Fantishka and the Pacific. Disneyland circa 1988. Sashed ribbons like glowworms swirled to posts. Gloss of blushed blue Tourette's high and dripping the crystalline syrup of fairy tales. We drove three days straight from, from Alberta to flip the silver arms of the gate to be let in. We had arrived, that was all that mattered. White ball cap against the glare of California. I had never worn such a thing. Every American large Yet the bread so white, almost holy, it haunts like the ghost in my gut. Look at my daughter in her denim shorts, Americanized thighs browned by weekends playing Sleeping Beauty on the green grass of their backyard. Space, she had waved both arms at me. I have space now. Two granddaughters already taller than me, outgrowing our tongue nearly as quickly as each new oversized t-shirt they wear. When I first saw the Pacific, I hid my tears in the shadow of the visor. I had been born landlocked, border locked, told where to stand, how to do it. The pink of my flesh shone in the open line between sea and horizon. I meant to wash the salt from my tears with the salt of the water. Then I drank it in secret as they all dozed on the beach. This is arrival, I thought, blue blush of departure. I let the water soak my calves, the silver arm of each wave as it buckled, the gate that let me in. And that poem uh, was published in Rock and Sling in, um, the winter issue of this year. And I think I'll read one more. Uh, thanks everyone again. And uh, this poem uh, is currently not out anywhere in the world. Um, I do tend to write a lot about uh, my family and uh, sort of the conflicting and often very troubling uh, stance, at least my father uh, takes on a lot of things. Uh, we uh, definitely battle head to head with a lot of ideas. And uh, just to be frank, um, you know, he's very anti-immigrant, even though we are immigrants, but he's um, has a very sort of staunch perspective on on things uh you know a lot of other issues there <laughs> uh this poem is called Greta Thunberg joins my family for dinner his words crack the seal of parched grain fall to the floor they knock against my ankles shudder leaf blown needle pressed in the swell of my breast as I grieve, 
my mother and I, and I exchange glances. My father's voice is a cascading saw, a clear cut across rising slopes, valley floors. I trace my eyes along the knots sliced flat, the dead tree we eat on. He slams the salad bowl to the floor, hollow wood and the slick face of oil, claims lack of space on the table it was just placed on. What happens to a young girl's body when men watch her willow buds, fuzz filled and eager to erupt? She, he cuts me off. What happens to a middle-aged woman's body when men watch her mouth tangle with air, pulped root ready to erupt? The salad bowl stays on the floor, another glass of Chardonnay. What happens to a man when he describes braids as lying to twist about a neck, a mouth with no business opening, breasts beating heart beneath? What happens to a man when he thinks of her hands, her voice lit from within? We continue to eat, salad, a neglected memory. My mother changes subject, another glass of Chardonnay. The steady, the steady, soft rupture of grain that never seals. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Yeah. That was amazing. Thank you, very, 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 very moving. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to welcome Richard Hoffman, uh, who's going to be sharing next. Uh, Richard's a memoirist, essayist, fiction writer, um, and poet, and full disclosure, he was also my mentor at Stone Coast, which is how uh, I knew him and we became friends. Uh, Richard, I, you're, you sent me a draft of Mundus al Infants months or a year ago, and it just took my breath away. And uh, it's a very dark tapestry, uh, it almost reminds me of where Guernica wanted to go or where we are now. And I, I know you're gonna read a section from it. Um, what was the final cork that popped it out onto the page for you, if, if that's a proper question, uh, or what sparked it into being? Well, I, I think that there's, uh, you know, the people who are on the bottom of this uh, horrific hierarchical way of organizing the world uh, are children. 70% of people killed in the world's wars are uh, civilians. And of those, more than 80% are children. This is, and yet we still, uh, you know, think about that as, you know, armies lining up on, to face each other across a battlefield. Um, uh, and the more I thought about um, children being gunned down in the streets, the more I thought, I have a poem for Tamir Rice uh, that has to do with my playing with a toy gun when I was a kid and making those sounds and twirling it around and saying, pew, 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 pew. and that's what he was doing. Um, there's a, there's a, there, are, well, to me, that was, that was an instigating event. Um, but these poems have been gathering for some time. So I think what, what I'll do is uh, just jump right into, uh, what I plan to do here. Um, and I want to thank the editors, uh, of course, Charles Coe and Alexis Latham, and uh, of course, Richard, uh, along with Tim and Hannah, our hosts. Uh, the writer James Baldwin, a visionary and voice of conscience, wrote in his essay, Notes from the House of Bondage, the children are always ours, every single one of them, all over the globe. And I am beginning to suspect that whoever is incapable of recognizing this may be incapable of morality. And I, 
believe this remark goes to the heart of understanding the failures of what has passed for morality for far too long. So the sequence I'm going to read from is called Mundus et Infants, The World and the Child, uh, which is a traditional trope in Western art. And it's an attempt to illuminate the geographies of injustice, asking implicitly, you know, what would an ethical and political system look like if we really put the welfare of children at the center? And if nothing else, the sequence marshals evidence against those sentimentalists who say that we already do that. I look around sometimes and I wonder what world they live in. So in this sequence, we encounter some biblical and mythological material. King Herod's slaughter of the innocent from Matthew's gospel. The figure of Rachel from the book of Jeremiah. Of course, Isaac, nearly murdered by his father, who was promised power and prosperity by the sky god Yahweh. And Iphigenia, murdered by her father to appease the god of the wind, so his armies could cross the sea to invade the city of Troy. I only have time for a sampling, three or four sections out of 12. Um, I begin by quoting a short poem by William Blake. The angel that presided o'er my birth said, little creature formed of joy and mirth, go love without the help of anything on earth. This is section two, art, a great investment says Forbes. For sale at auction, wooden Santos from Mexico, hand painted in colorful uniforms, rough hewn, nearly identical figurines, swords drawn, holding children's bloody heads, arms, legs, arranged in the Sotheby's brochure around a screaming mother. The Massacre of the Innocent, Artist Unknown. A recurrent theme in Western art, Rubens, Bruegel, Poisson, Ghirlandaio. Amid the charred ribs of a school bus in Yemen, a fragment of fuselage. Commercial and government entity code, C-A-G-E, like a return address. Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Burlington, Massachusetts, Falls Church, Virginia. Engineering a better tomorrow. And in the bramble, a ram entangled. Oh, angel of outrage, where are you? For arms, say, aerospace. For surveillance, information systems. For bombers, say, defense. For taxes, say, earnings. Say, second quarter, on track, say, 62 billion US dollars. A voice was heard in Ramah, Rachel weeping for her children. A Saudi apologist claimed the Yemeni school was teaching insurrection. King Herod's fear, precisely Herod's fear. In Bruegel's version, blood on the village snow. In Ghirlandaio's blood on the plaza's stones, imperial architecture in the background. In Poisson's, a sandaled soldier, his foot on a baby's neck, dispassionately sight down the blade. In the Rubens, it is hard to separate the mothers from their babies. The scene is one great mass of writhing flesh. At the border, the official explained, it is hard to separate the mothers from Mexico, from their babies. Confia en mi, por favor, senora. Déjame llevarla y traerle algo de comer. They are enclosures, the official said. We are uncomfortable with that term, cage. They are temporary structures of chain link. A voice was heard in Ramah, Rachel weeping for her children. To comfort them, 
to warm them, to console them. They have each been given a blanket made of foil. At auction, the Rubens sold for $75 million. And in the bramble, a ram entangled. Oh, angel of outrage, where are you? Rubens, Bruegel, Poisson, Girlandio, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, General Electric, Herod, Franco, Trump, Mohammed bin Salman. Historians are skeptical the massacre took place. Flavius Josephus does not mention it, but the Orthodox Church has for millennia held that Herod as punishment was eaten alive by worms. This is section six, it's called Tribute. And it is for Patrick McSorley. Patrick McSorley was among the earliest and most powerful voices to speak out against the widespread sexual assault of, on children by Catholic priests. He had been assaulted as a 12 year old boy by the Reverend John J. Gagan, a notorious abuser with hundreds of victims. After a long struggle with addiction, likely a consequence of the sexual abuse, he died at age 29. Tribute. This man once, he went down. This time none, not one man, not one pill, not one hope could stop him. Not one cry, not one hand could reach him. Not one lie could save him. He went down. This man lived where men fear what they know and knew what he knew and spoke the truth. Not one bond could turn him. Not one friend could soothe him. He went down. We mourn him. Section seven is called Progress. Iphigenia, Isaac, kids, bugs on the windshield ever since. Story, explanation, lowdown, narrative, narration, citation, recital, report, take, version, rundown, score, Apologue, allegory, metaphor, myth, parable, fable, discourse, propaganda, treatise, testament, epic, justification, rationale, excuse. We're sorry, something went wrong. Please try your query again. Fish gotta swim, birds gotta fly, boats gotta sail. Fish, birds, boats, kids, Swim, fly, sail, die at the direction of frowning, serious, disciplined men who grew up with me in America on their bikes, on roller skates, under the horse chestnut trees, trading baseball cards they bought with money from their paper routes. The nightmare true now, nightmare of my Cold War boyhood, true to children elsewhere. And in the bramble, a ram entangled. Oh, angel of outrage, where are you? Because everybody needs a job. We are one great mass of writhing flesh. Because fear begets profits and profits beget more nifty gadgets. First best gizmo off the line is always an idea, an assumption, a mysterious immaterial twin to every sleek weapon thereafter, a prayer to consecrate the idol. Years of this, decades, generations. Hey, I'm just trying to make a buck. Oh, shake us, make our hearts hammer shame in the face. 
Now blood drips from public monuments like icicles in spring. We no longer know how to know what we know. Error 404, not found. Section nine, Isaac's dream. Who's there? Who's there? It's dark. I'm afraid I can't see. No one, only an old nightmare. Now I'm falling into nowhere while a body looms above me. Who is it? Who's there? Who's pulling my hair and muttering so angrily? No one, only an old nightmare. A hand on my throat, air. I garble a choked plea. Who's there? Who's there? I hear moaning somewhere, cry out and wake abruptly. No one. Only an old nightmare. Slowly, I see the dream was in fact a memory. And I know who was there, my father, my old nightmare. And this is the last section I'll read. It. It's, it's the final section of the sequence. It's called Seer. In Euripides' Dur version, Artemis, to whom men pray for permission to kill wild creatures of her forests, spirits Iphigenia away to Taurus, where she makes prophecy of the single thing she knows, denied by all who seek her. Children will be sacrificed for advantage, for victory, what she knows is always so. It's almost too easy, almost. Hardest are the armored men who clatter up her stairs. She knows the harm they will do and that no words will stop them. Thank you. Yeah. That was fabulous. Thank you. Bravo. Fabulous. Thank fabulous. You. Thank, thank you. you very much. Oh, thank you for that, Richard. Uh, okay, I'd like to share Rose Clue to, to the star stage. She's an Igbo American actor, poet, and healthcare futurist. I'd like you to explain healthcare futurist because I love both independently. Uh, at some point, you explore the intersection of religiosity and mythology and gender-based trauma in the African diaspora. Uh, so share some of this with us. This is a, a tapestry background. <laughs> yeah, um, well, I'll explain. Uh, hi, everyone, first of all, and thank you, um, 0830 Club. Uh, thank you, Alexis. Thank you, everyone with the Bout Place Journal and the Black Earth Institute and all the poets reading tonight. Um, it is an honor and a pleasure to be with all of you guys. Um, uh, healthcare futurists, just to begin with that. So I, many of you might uh, know what an Afrofuturist is, reimagining the future um, with Africans or members of the African diaspora differently. Um, I just borrowed the futurist part and added healthcare because I believe in a healthcare system. I'm a pediatrician by training, um, practiced for a while and also did a lot of work in politics and health policy. I imagine a healthcare system that is equitable, that centers the person and not the profits. Um, reminds us that every one of us are human because as a black female who is also a physician and a patient, I have seen the worst <laughs> of what our healthcare system can do. So when I give talks on healthcare, I talk about what we need to be doing and how we need to imagine again, not even reimagine, but just imagine again all over what it should look like. So that's where that comes from. Um, the poems that I'm going to read tonight, uh, one of which appears in the upcoming journal, I am so excited to read this just based off of everything we've heard today, um, 
looks at the Biafra War. The Biafra War started in 1967, July 6, 1967, and ended January 14, 15 of 1970. Um, another name for it is the Nigerian Civil War. Um, my family is from Nigeria. I'm first generation American. And um, thinking about war, thinking about terrain, how it impacted my family, um, but then also me, who is a descendant of survivors who hears about it in, in bits and pieces is really what I like to explore and how memory can not only be fiction, but um, can be sort of the source of hope too. So that's, that's where I'm, I'm reading from tonight. So the first poem I'm going to read is called Infreta. Infreta is a um, it is an Italian phrase you hear a lot frequently, um, just to say somebody's in a hurry, but it's more like somebody has some level of frenetic energy. And this is from the Biafra War series. Infreta. Once the last air raid ended, we gathered ourselves, looked left and entered the main road the sun splicing heat into our skin. An old bus, like a rusty metal lunchbox appeared, puttering at the speed of anguish, no passengers. From a distance, our march could have been mistaken for a bloated centipede, sluggish, out of place. We barreled along, outwitting bombs ordained for stationary targets. Move. Any, some, where, jump on, stagger off. The sun will still chase us into our graves. Mm. So the poems that come from the Biafra War series are based off of interviews I've done with family members and other survivors over the last, um, wow, I guess it's seven years now, um, interviews with them and my own experiences mixed in um, to these stories. So that's some of what you're hearing is based on what people have actually told me and also what I've remembered over the years from what my parents and other family members have mentioned. The second poem is called The Things They Carried. And this was, I should mention the previous poem was first um, published in Cider Press Review. This one was published in uh, War Literature and the Arts and it's called The Things They Carried. In her brain's left pocket, she stuffs the image of a pregnant woman's belly split open on the side of Abba Road, a bloodied cord dangling without a human anchor. She will try not to speak of this when she is asked what she remembered about that time. Instead, she will wrap those secrets in banana leaves and boil them until they congeal something hard and visible to throw away or eat. The warning that once formed in her mouth to protect her children now hangs in the back of her throat like a mischievous child that can't gag its way out of the jungle gym. She remembers who showed the enemy their hiding place. She places her dreams of love and a goosey in her right brain next to a photo of home. She tilts her head to the left as if the question she is about to answer is difficult to balance. If you see my people, she tells him, Tell them yesterday had too much to carry. Tell them not to eat what has not been wrapped and boiled for consumption. Tell them only that some of us had to relieve ourselves on the side of the road, our futures too heavy to hold. And gently let mama know what her children have done to her children. The third poem is, uh, will appear in the May 1st issue of About Place Journal, and it is called When God Sat in Enugu, We Wondered Who We Were, Enugu State, Biafra, 1968. Enugu became the seat of the Republic of Biafra during the Nigerian Civil War. Uh, Radio Biafra, headquartered in Enugu, transmitted daily status updates from the war front to the people of Biafra. As starvation and death overwhelmed the Republic, the voice of Radio Biafra became like that of God. When God sat in Enugu, we wondered who we were, the stream that catches war's peculiar rainfall or the spigot from where salt sprinkles the morning, 
the crack where grown seep into sky, or the spear of salvation, or the Israelites hearing from the God cloud claiming their promised land, or skin draped rubies strung from barbed wire trees, the groan clotting in God's throat while our fate clings to wiretaps. Did he barb wire trees to the sky to keep us from clinging? Is our blood the rainfall that puts God at ease? Are we just fetching him from the stream of our lives? We seep into trees, into sky falling, keep our seer cries out of God's hearing, grown streams of barbed wire to catch the war falling, to catch the war falling from the sky. God sits on rubies, hangs our fear out every morning. Barbed wire is a tree in the shape of a promise. We sip rubies from that stream every morning and after hang throats out to dry. O oh, Inugu sky morning from where ruby salt falls, from where cloud filled promises wandered, finally at ease our salvation. I'm going to end uh, with uh, a poem. We are talking about geographies of justice and something um, I like to do in um, workshops that I hold um, is to think about the body as a geography. Um, as I said, in, in healthcare, there are certain bodies or uh, certain vessels, human vessels that aren't uh, given the same dignity as others. Um, so I bring that into some of my work. Today is also the my birthday, the 13th birthday of no evidence of disease. Um, I was diagnosed with cancer 14 years ago. And um, yeah, 14 years ago. And today, 13 years ago was when the doctor said no evidence of disease. So this is a poem about Yay. that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, this is a poem about that. It first appeared in my in my first collection called The Evolution of a Saint. And this is a remix of it, which appeared in Pink Magazine right before the pandemic. And it's called, And I Don't Want to Break No More. Verse one, white walls, white jackets, white sheets, black stethoscope wrapping the white neck of one doctor with words that cut black like cancer inside this black body, me, me in the black can't see, the cancer see the way the cancer sees me. And you together, all the together, places in this body apart break until you see me, see me, only broken pieces. Verse two, it's just a word, so say it like you mean it. Let it roll off your tongue like it does for the man with the white neck in the white jacket leaning against the white wall watching me shift. Under white lights beam like betrayal of my scarred body, reflect light his words back to me, back to me, back to me, back to me, back to me. Break. Weigh me down to sleep or leave me holding this weight. My future in the hands of a rapidly growing economy the size of a butterfly with the bravado of a white American telling a black American where her place in the world is, how to exist in this world is, how to beat this shit like he beat this shit with the best insurance money could buy, privilege. Chorus. Cancer was the mistake that my body let happen. The mistake that my body let happen was cancer. Black like forgive my mistaken body. Let happen my body, let happen my body. Let my body happen until it is me, seeing 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 me, whole again. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jess. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now uh, I'd like to welcome Claudia Salibi Savage, whom I've had the pleasure to read with uh, maybe three years ago when there wasn't a big pandemic, and uh, very much enjoyed her lush poetry and performance. And uh, you know, she's also part of a team with her husband. Uh, let me see, what is it? 
you so tell us Claudia. Oh, it's, it's thick in the throat honey it's from a <laughs> thick in the throat honey it's from a poem of mine my husband picked it yeah john he's what a he's name <laughs> thick in the throat honey thick okay in the throat that honey. does yeah uh i'm really excited to hear you here tonight and, uh, and to finish this all up so um Please take it away, Claudia. Thank you. Thanks so much, Richard and Alexis and Michael and everybody um, from the Black Earth Institute. And thanks so much for inviting me. I am searching and my fellow poets, man, it's so good to hear like <laughs> this kind of poetry, just people just laying it down. It's just so good. I, you know, mm -hmm. I never get sick of it. Um, let me hold on a second. I'm I'm looking for my poems because I got so enraptured with what was happening there. I was like, <laughs> what? I have to do something now? Are you kidding me? Oh my gosh. Okay. Um, I'm going to read. Uh, I'm looking at our time too. I don't want to go too far over. Um, I'm going to read. Claudia, it's okay. We don't have to end it in an hour. Okay. We're, we're flexible here. Okay. Uh, you're I'm not going to turn into a goose or something i don't know <laughs> i know i know but i you know i have i have small people that you know i have to feed um so so here i'm going to read um all three pieces from the about place and then one extra little guy um so the first poem i'm going to read uh is from a work in progress about um the war in that continues in syria um and uh the many many well, frankly, this is about an artist that has been murdered by fundamentalists. Um, and uh, his name, he he had left Syria and then his wife remains and he and his son came back because she had died and they wanted to bury her. And then he and his son were killed. Um, his name is Mohammed Bashir al Anani. Um, so I will read this poem. It's called To Kill a Poet First, You Must Destroy the World. When you touch me after our daughter is born, you recall that water goes back to the sea, though I'm a stream forgotten by the clouds. The valleys of me don't plump. I'm salted torn meat. I hang on invisible hooks. The past dissolves in our daughter's hungry hole. Mine is barely alive. I could fake it, but that was never our story. Even now, as you pretend to want what's left. A friend said she gave her pussy to the second child. Her clitoris cleaved and jagged. I'm a poet. I claw my way to desire. The poet takes whatever they feel and heals the world. Before the war, the orange tree silenced us with its blossoms. Before the war, we were three. My wife, my son. The poet takes whatever is left and breathes it back alive. Um, and I'm gonna read uh, two poems uh, about my grandmother in this collection that is making the rounds. So who knows when it will come out? <laughs> who knows? Could be a decade from now. Okay. Um, but, uh, I write a series of poems to my grandmother, my Lebanese grandmother, um, who we called Siti. And so, um, which means grandmother in Levantine Arabic, there's all different ways to say it. Some people say Jitti, Siti. Um, so I'm gonna read this one, this is to her. It's Siti learns the word token. <clears throat> my family resists one word. White Americans in Portland with no ties to another continent ask me where my veil is. Here, I am forever labeled Siti, thanks to our pan-Arab brother's rage, America's constant stamp of other. 
To most, I don't mention my Jewish mother. To most, I don't mention the great, great, great grandmother from Scotland, blue eyes surprising a brown face east of Beirut. I don't mention how sometimes I'm tired, how I excuse myself for another drink when talk of ancestry begins. And Austria, in Italy, in Poland, in Hungary, in Lebanon, in Syria, here, 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 fear mongers erect steel walls. They beat the desperate with clubs. The wolf grows fat with hoarding. I dream of the breath's exit. My mother's neshama before, after the brain surgeries. My daughter's first tooth exits her mouth. Her gums give up rivers. I want to bandage the world. Keep their them in. Keep their my in. I dream of blood between my legs, out my ears, my stomach a country split and spilling, children carried away from another safety zone, more shrapnel than limbs, their mothers, their fathers wrapping them in whatever is left. Siti, your long brown arms would have cleared a path. See the lightning, you'd say. Bend the sky. Um, I, know, I just wanted to say also that I, t I, I tend to use uh, Hebrew and um, Arabic a lot in this collection and, and that there was a word there, um, the Shama in Hebrew means, um, it means the spirit or the, the soul. It's often used as sort of a, a sweet thing to say to someone is like, you're important in my life, you know, like, I care about your breath, I care about your soul um, in my life. It's quite lovely. So uh, now I will read another city poem. Um, my grandmother, like many, gra many immigrant grandmothers, um, yeah, she, uh, she was kind of embarrassed by Arabic. Uh, she wanted to be as American as possible <laughs> uh, in the way that she thought that should be. So all her recipes are written in her chicken scratches, as she called them, all this Arabic, and like nobody in my family can decipher them, which is really funny. So, um, <laughs> so I remember by feel, as many people do. So this is called Siti Teaches Me Arabic as Pastry. <clears throat> Arabs invented mathematics, so you triangle the dough so quickly I dizzy. I thought everyone ate them. Sweet fatty lamb and rich pine nuts, cinnamon and bitter parsley, yogurt tang to sweat the tongue, your recipes, undecipherable dashes and ribbons across the paper, a dance in the mouth, even before the mouth silent confident fingers that crease and twirl it can't be 30 years Siddi. how could you go before teaching me the word for faith for hope february 2021 12.4 million syrians are food insecure 80 percent of the displaced are women and children where is your recipe numbers I can understand. One tablespoon of cinnamon, four cups of milk. Sorrow steals my sleep. I am not immune. I need handfuls of surety, pastry commune, green parsley bruise, the only ache. And the, thank you. And this last uh, poem uh, is after one of my favorite poems ever written. Um, and of course, now I can't remember the name of that poem, but it is by Joy Katz, who um, wrote a poem, a definition, kind of a definition poem for her mom about the Holocaust. 
I think it's something like my mom shows me the dictionary. I can't remember what, the, I'm so sorry, Joy. Wherever you are, Joy, sorry about that. Um, but I do say it's after her and this poem is called Terrorist. Was it the Oklahoma City bombing? No, it was my grandmother's living rooms. Meditations on Germany, Iran, Lebanon, Israel, from the French, terrorist, 1795, to take down a king, guillotine for injustice, or 1920, to colonize a country. One grandmother could name hers. Hitler killed her, she said, fingering a photo of my great aunt's curls. Terrorist equals fanatic one who causes terror, but also terrorist equals those who seek to purge perceived indifference, to create the world in their image. Someone who, as Voltaire said, persecutes his brother because he is not of his opinion. My other grandmother would say, fear your neighbor. They'll lend you milk one month hit your feet to the car's bumper the next. Both grandmothers assumed everyone who wasn't us wanted us dead. We, you are an impediment. We, you who cause alarm, dread. We, you who cause panic. My grandmothers are dead. Tell me, in which moment do you become blind to another's face. It is sometimes hard to leave the house now. Signs everywhere declare the need for justice. The word gives me hives. I do not know when here became here. I do not know when my brothers and sisters in Lebanon, in Syria, in my own town, went from demanding with voices to demanding with guns. And was it us? or you who changed the flag from symbol to spear? Are we fighters? Are we clear? I am uncomfortable with my own face. My rage sparks daily. For my daughter's sake, I hug my own chest. Breathe into my rapid heart. Stop now, I say to the mirror. Stop now terrorist thank you wow thank you claudia mm, uh, mm, mm. thank all of you uh for your geographies uh spiritual physical emotional uh you're all over the map in beautiful and horrific and truthful ways. And uh, this was quite a sampling of the issue to come uh, that you're gonna be seeing uh, on May 1st. And Alexis, uh, thank you very much for wrestling all of these pieces. It was not easy <laughs> to say. Uh, I've been part of this, uh, I edited an issue myself and this issue had about three quarters essays out of about maybe 500. So there was an awful lot of reading. Usually it's poetry and if you're a poet, well, okay, you know, there's shorter pieces, but uh, a lot of work went into this, a lot of really deep work. And uh, Charles Coe and Alexis and I, uh, we met a lot about this and we, we're proud of all of you, uh, all of your works. and. It is going to be a marvelous, marvelous issue. And uh, so now uh, we're over with the show, but this particular venue is sort of like uh, what the 0830 Club tries to do is create like a cabaret virtually. So, you know, there's a, there's a smoker's room if you guys still smoke, whatever you want to smoke. Uh, there's a drinking room if you want to make yourself a drink. Uh, there's a room to hang out with friends. Uh, 
So I'm going to turn this over to Tim because, you know, this doesn't end now. You can check out now if you have other things to do, but the party continues in, in uh, the gallery or the breakout rooms where we can all talk with each other. We can ask each other questions. Uh, uh, Tim, what do you want to do at this point? Uh, should we let, ask, let anyone ask any questions from the audience? I don't know. I, I certainly think after something as moving as that, if people want to uh, directly ask questions, let's just hang here for a minute. I mean, that was just a, a string of amazing, um, uh, amazing readers. And also, I would love to have um, somebody that's got it handy put the link in the chat of where to access the journal when it does come online on May 1st, um, so everybody can get that. I don't know if you had, did you have any of the visual artists there? I know we've got a couple of <laughs> representations we can share on that. Um, but for, I'd say, let's take about Let's just take a couple minutes now while we're still going live, see if there's any reaction, and then we'll uh, say goodbye to the Facebook world. And we'll just all hang out here. If, uh, if you want, the, uh, the gallery has an um, interview recorded with Michael McDermott that will tell you more about the origins of Black Earth. Um, so that's, that would be it. Does anybody have any questions for any of the readers before they have to jump off? Or any reactions? It was so much to take in all at once and it was so rich. It was just so incredibly rich. I can't imagine uh, how slowly I'm going to have to work my way through this issue. <laughs> you will. <laughs> and that's a, good, that's a good thing. I mean, you know, you get you get issues in magazines that you're in, you know, and you go, eh, 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 there's my poem. And then, you know, you're looking for something to grab you and you look, you know, so yeah, I get stacks of them in this room, you know. And <laughs> uh, I, I don't, I don't, yeah, comparisons are odious, but this was just <laughs> beyond uh, all expectations. And so I can't wait. I can't wait to see the issue. It's just, I got to say, I was bowled over, and I've been sort of. Karen's been poking me to check this out. And hello again, Richard. Haven't seen you in hey. ages. Hey, Barry. Uh, and doing? Tim. Yeah. Um, hey, and I got to say, this is just boggling in the quality and the, the range. I'm like, yes, this is the place I want to spend time. Absolutely. Michael, what do you have to say? <laughs> um, I, I was really moved. Uh, the opportunity to see people doing two and three and four and five things and talking about their work. Uh, I mean, my, my uh, emotional level was shifted. And the, the, not only is it, it, uh, it not, only, not only is it emotional, but your, your, your baseline shifts. And you listen to different realities, and you diff listen to different people, and I was moved. Thank you very, very much. I feel the same way. Um, I'm a poet, and I work as a poet in schools in Austin, and I also lost my son 10 years ago. Um, I was so moved. I had to turn my screen off. I just, you guys literally just ripped my heart out and showed it to me in all these beautiful scenarios with, you know, speaking about your father and your work and your interpretations of your history and your lineage and where you come from. I was so absolutely moved. I took four pages of notes and I'm so inspired. So thank you so very, very much. Thank, thank you all for sharing your voices and your minds and your hearts with us tonight. I'm so very, very moved. Thank you. I want to say that I all those poems, I've read them over and over again, just not because I had to, but because I I needed to just keep reading them over and over again. And just hearing you read them was like rediscovering them all over again. And it was just, 
incredible to hear you all read beautifully. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's just, I, I'm just, just so stunned that I had anything to do with bringing these amazing poems into the world. It feels like a great honor. Right. So right, I right, want right, to right, thank right. you for offering them to us. Right. And I'm so glad that, uh, that they're out there for the world to read. I, th I see that each one is just a partial uh, representation, a partial statement of what's a much larger thing. And to see this tonight and then, and then to read the poems in the journal, it opens your world and you want to hear, you want to hear more and more and more and more and more. I really, really thank you for opening up this world. Well, everybody embodied their work so deeply that often isn't the case. Uh, it just simply isn't. Uh, it's difficult to let the words into your body and out again into public. It's a very courageous and intimate thing. And all of you did that in a very spectacular way uh, to allow us to experience <laughs> your deep emotions. And uh, that is a rare gift. Thank you. I remember so, about 20 years ago when the Cantab started its slam poetry and open mic. What was amazing to me is I had just met my husband before he was my husband and he dragged me down to this I mean, it was voted the best dive bar in, in Cambridge for years and years, but they had the slam scene downstairs in an even darker space. <laughs> and there was standing room only from the beginning. And what I got after several years of going there is that people were actually incredibly hungry for real words. Real words that said something. I mean, there was nowhere to sit. You couldn't even... You, I would sit on this really sticky staircase just so I could hear what was going on because there was nowhere else. And that's been true for a really long time in, in this country anyway, that people have been hungry as hell for words that say something. So thank you. Yeah, although it was actually more like 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not count. We've now published, I think, 800 artists. Uh, and for, for what that's worth, uh, each issue now in the, three, in, the, in, the, in the six months before the next one comes out, gets about anywhere from 7,000 to 9,000 views. Uh, just on the artist's pages, not on any of the administrative pages. And for the, uh, for the year, you can get anywhere from say uh, nine, 9,500 to 14 or 15,000. So we think that it's really getting out there. Uh, we're very pleased with that. We're very pleased by what it's become. It's become a vehicle for artists to express themselves on, on themes of the day, emphasizing a little bit environmental issues, but certainly social justice issues as a major, major, major view. And I'm, I'm very proud to have done this. I think Patricia would have been very, very proud. <laughs>